Levi at the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you, that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. What's this mountain? Is, is he in Egypt? No. He's at Mount Horeb, which is a part of the Sinai, of the Arabian Peninsula. That, to me, is so cool. I mean, he tells us. We just didn't see it for so long. So then, we know Moses goes back. We know he meets Pharaoh. We know the, the plagues. We know all that happens. And then he comes back. Let's go to um, Exodus 14. I'm doing this in the order that, that Moses did it, not the order that I did it while I was there. Because I, want it, I know that in my mind, I want to see it, remember what the picture was like, how it went, what was the day, what was the, what was the tra- way they traveled. Exodus 14. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Pharaoh between Migdal and the sea. You shall camp in front of Baal Zephon, opposite it, by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, They are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Then the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled. Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people, and they said, What is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot ready and took his people with him, and he took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt and officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them camping by the sea. This is where this happened, y'all, this picture. Beside Pirarath in front of Baal Zephon, As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness." But Moses said to the people, I love this verse, Do not fear. Stand by and see the Yeshua, the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent, Lisa. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. As for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. You know this story, but this is where it happened. The next slide. See, I, I was always at the wrong place. I was up, you know, at the top of the Red Sea. This is further down. It was, it's called Nefu, Nebulun. Or, uh, it was on that first map. This picture that you see right now, this is the pillar that Solomon put there. He marked that place that you just saw. He marked it on both sides. Did you ever not learn that when you were growing up? No, you didn't. This next slide is what the sea looks like once you get on that side. See how pretty it is? Now let's go to Exodus 15, 22 through 26. So they've come across. Now what do they need? Remember, it's a Red Sea. It's salty. They need water, don't they? 
So we go to Exodus 15, 27. I'm sorry, 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. When they came to Marah, the cloud, they, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There he made for them a statute and a regulation, and there he tested them. This slide is at Marah. And he said, You will give earnest heed to the voice of the, if you will, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I the Lord am your healer. Immediately he goes into the commandments. Statutes. Has he even given those yet? <laughs> okay, so that's three pictures of Mara there where that happened. Then we go to 1527. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 date palms. Remember, there's 12 tribes. And do you remember? We're about to find out there's 70 elders. Everything points to each other. This is the opening from the sea. I'm doing this backwards because I actually went from the desert to the sea, so I'm doing my slides to you from the sea to the desert the way they did it. But I want you to see how these walls are. These walls are huge. They go way up 600 feet at least. And it's very cool in there. Okay, we're out in the desert. This is an oasis. They were going from oasis to oasis, if you'll remember. This next slide, you can see... It if you can see very well, you see there's little tiny people here. That's how big this is. This is huge. It's very cool. It was my most, I thought this was the most beautiful part of my trip. You could just hear the brook. You, there was, you know, lots of water. You know, the, the sound there was, you, you could hear each other talking for a long way off. I took a lot of, see the little tiny people here? I took a lot of pictures here. To me, this was a huge canyon. Remember, we're dealing with about three million people. And so they're going through, and he tells you they go through in stages later on in the scripture. There were palms. You know, that's the one thing I love to do about Israel, wherever I am, and you go and you, maybe God mentions a tree or this or that in the scripture. It's not that tree, but it's the descendant of that tree. So can you see the, in this one, you can see the creek kind of going through right here. Right here. I took a lot of pictures of Elim because I just thought that that, I'm sure they were tired of being in the desert and this was just a cool place for them to just get a little bit of restoration, get some water. The, the, um, there's some of the palms. It was very soggy ground the whole time through that canyon. If you ever go there, make sure you go to Elim. I, like I said, I took several pictures because I just wanted y'all to see how cool it is. There was a lot of grass growing there. We were one of the first groups to ever get to go through Elim on this, legally. I'm sure there's been people that have done it illegally, but we were the first legal group that got to go through this so it was a lot of firsts on this trip. It was kind of cool. They're all of a sudden they want to be tourists and they want to use Moses. They didn't want to for ever and ever, but now I believe God's just taking that cover off in these last days. There's more of the palms. They were spread out. Remember there was dates on the palms so they could eat. Remember when it's called the land of milk and honey, it's date honey. So this is uh, my group standing around one of the wells. Can you see that right there? That's one of the 12 wells. And they have them, they have each one of them, you know, that they, they know where they are. This next picture 
is a picture. I said, well, what is that? And this is called Sodom's apples. Can you see that fruit that's falling off here? It's called Sodom's apples. And women used it back then to cause miscarriages. So you did not want to eat this. But this was in that, it was in that Elim when I was there. Let's, let's go to Exodus 17, 1 through 7. Then the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsty, thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to this people? A little more, and, I, and they may stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it. This is the end of Elim. Sorry, there's a delay on this. Okay, hold on. It's John... There it is. This is the wilderness of sin. A lot of us have lived there, right? <laughs> That's what it looks like. <laughs> and then we get to the rock. And it looks different from all angles, so I've got several different angles to show you. This rock is huge. I'm going to show you in just a minute what I look like next to this rock. But there's, it's showing you from different ways, and you would look around it, and you could see probably where it had filled up with the water for them to drink. There's another view of it. Let's look. Okay, he says, um, And so Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarrel of some of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then... Amalek came and fought against Israel. Okay, that's what this next slide, right here by this split rock, is where the fight with Amalek happened, okay? This is, you can see where the, all the people were. All of these places make so much sense. You can see where all the people would have been. You can see the mountain where you thought that Moses probably went up. Remember when they held his arms up during the whole battle right there? People think it was there. There's all kind of pictographs on these rocks here that people have discovered. Here's another. Um, another picture of that, that battlefield. Here's another picture of you can see the split rock from a different angle. We were going all the way around it. These are just different places where They've found the pictographs. This is another giant photo of that battleground. And to me, that was just so cool to sit there. That's what I want you to do tonight, too, while we're talking about this. Think about this. Think about that. That's where that happened. That's where, remember, God stopped the sun. You remember the whole thing? I mean, I don't have time to teach all that, but that, that, this, it's just pretty amazing when you look out at these places that this is really where it happened that's been hidden for so long. And I'll tell you this, Israel's gotten very interested in Saudi Arabia in the last few little bit. Because in Jeremiah, well, in Jubilees, Jeremiah says that, that the ark's hidden there. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, we don't need the ark for the next temple, right? But I'm just telling you, this, this is a very important place. Elijah's cave is also on this mountain where he came, where Paul came. So now you can sort of see, let me show you this last. Can you see that's me right there? 
That's how big that rock is. I'm way down there. This is kind of far up here. I didn't climb that one. I was saving all my energy for Mount Sinai. So then we know after that, uh, Jethro comes and talks to Moses, remember? And he talks to him about, you know, you need to get judges. You need to get some help. You've got too much on your plate, right? So he's journeying on. This is, this is from there to the other side to get over to, to where we climb the Mount Sinai, where, it's where Moses' altar is, where the golden calf is. This is just some of the rock formations there. I took pictures of... Um, you know, the camels. Camels are just everywhere. You know, that's just the herd. Things haven't changed much there since that time. These were guys that were our guides. You know, they're using the same kind of tents. They're eating the same food. They eat the same way. They eat with their hands. They don't carry utensils. They go to the restaurant in the same place. The women wear the same outfits. I mean, nothing has changed much in this country until right now. And, and people are really trying to come in there and change it really quickly right now. It's not really working with these guys, but in the big cities, it's kind of taken. Women are getting a little bit more free, but it's, it's just funny when you think about it, that that society has changed less than any other society really on the face of the earth. There's more camels. So now Moses gets to Mount Sinai, to the, to the bottom of Mount Sinai. Let's go to Exodus 19.1. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Remember, they're just going around. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. You could see all the wide open where they would, where they would have been. Now, we're going to start um, up the mountain. So right here at the bottom of the mountain, we've already hiked in about 40 minutes, and now we're at, we're at um, the altar of Moses. Okay, that, remember where Moses did the covenant with the people? That's what's this over here. This is the sheepfolds. This is the altar. Exodus 24, 1 through 11. Let's go there. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu. Remember, they're the high priests. They're Aaron's sons. And 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. Do you see these white stones right here? These are the 12 pillars. I wanted to show you. I snuck out of Arabia with a few rocks. This is what they made the white pillars of. This is all over the riverbed, or the wadi, okay? You can look at them if you want to afterwards. It said, um, He sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. This, to me, is always... I always wanted to go to Israel and get a cow and split it in half and show everybody what a covenant ceremony was. And my guides always thought I was crazy. But, but this, is, this is what happened there. This is when they had the marriage covenant between Yahweh and Israel. That's what this is right here. And that's what happened right there. I'm walking on this one. I'm walking more towards the sheepfolds. I want to show you the sheepfolds because they, they had built pens for these sheepfolds for all of the sacrifice. See all that? That's the sheepfolds where they had for the sacrifices for this that we're talking about right now. He took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. 
Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet were appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. So now I'm starting up the mountain. We've just gotten to the altar. Now we start up the mountain. That's another picture of those pillars from a different view. This is uh, my guide, Sod, that was taking me up this mountain. You can't tell by this mountain. You can't tell by these pictures. I've been hiking all my life. I'm a cowgirl. I ride in Wyoming, Montana, where I've ride. I, you know, I've been on some treacherous stuff. This, to me, was the most treacherous thing I ever did. It's not climbing a mountain. It's not falling off of a mountain is what it is. There's no trail. It's just different kinds of rocks, different broken rocks. You know, I really prayed about it. Chris okayed for me to do it. My daughter prayed over me. Everybody, you know, y'all were praying. I literally felt as I was going up this mountain, I felt like God had me just like this, and I was going up. I never got out of breath. I didn't get a scrape. I didn't, there was thorns everywhere. There was a snake. I mean, there was, it was all kind of stuff. It was hot. I didn't take a drink of water the first two and a half hours. I'm telling you, it was God, not me. As we, this is my group that we, we decided we would do the peak. I mean, we would do the plateau. This was the plateau group. We, we were going where the 70 elders went. That's where we wanted to go. There was a younger crowd that wanted to go to the peak. I didn't feel qualified to go to the peak. But you can't, I, if you've taken pictures in mountains, you know that pictures never do them justice. You can't tell depth. You can't tell. This, we are very high up right here, very high up, and we've just avoided death several times, okay? People got hurt. There was all kind of things that happened on this thing. But I just felt prayers lifted me up. This is Farouk, a different guide. I followed every, I felt like God told me to just take every step he took. So he'd take a step, I'd take a step. This is me, almost to the top. Uh, my father didn't even recognize me in this picture. He said, who's that guy? Uh, <laughs> We all had to be covered up at every second, you know, looking not very cute. Um, but it was so exhilarating. It was, it was, this is Farouk. He, he jumped up on this other thing. I didn't do that. But now we get up to, after two hours and 45 minutes, we got to the um, plateau. This is the plateau. This is the peak. Can you see that? Can you see that it's black and burned? My group, two girls that were younger than I am, were my girls that we, that, uh, that was Alma, that was Alma and um, Melissa. We encouraged each other. Melissa almost quit several times. This is me on the top. You can't hear what I'm saying, but I'm telling you, this is the plateau and this old lady made it. Um, but you can see I, I'm doing a circle around where all that was. This stone I got from there. that looked like, to me, in the sun, it was very blue. It was very, very blue. I'm not sure that he saw stones. I mean, he probably just saw heaven. I don't know what he saw. This is, uh, that's us looking up at the peak. That would have been another hour and a half to two hours more to go up that. And again, can you see those rocks? You're climbing those rocks. There's no trail. There is no trail. This is another view of us. We, we, then, now what's going on? Let's get to, we're, let's get to um, Exodus 20. I already did that, 1 through 11. Let's do Exodus. Let's go to Exodus 32. Remember, Moses is up there. He's getting instructions and all that kind of stuff's going on for 40 days. Let's go to uh, Exodus 32, 1 through 6. When he comes down, and you can tell when you come down off that mountain, you can look straight across when you're still pretty high up, and you can see this. And this is the altar of the calf, the golden calf. That's what this is. Uh, there's all kind of pictographs all over it. Let me back up. Let me give you another second. I went too fast on that. But you could, and because of the acoustics there, you, know, you can hear everything from far off. But we know that he, when he came down, he could see that 
altar. If you remember, Joshua heard the singing. You remember? He thought they were having war or something. And let's, let's get to Exodus 32, 1 through 6. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come and make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. And then all of the people tore off the gold rings with which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Well, they were going to kind of remember the Lord here, weren't they? <laughs> we're going to make it up as we go. We'll change it to how we want it to be. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. When I was coming down and I look over there, you could just kind of feel, think of what Moses felt, how he felt. That he came down, he'd just been doing all this. They just had the marriage covenant. He goes up for 40 days, he's on the biggest high, and he comes down, and everyone's acting like an idiot. He says, let's go to 15 through 19. It says, When Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets which were written on both sides, they were written on one side and the other, the tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There's a sound of war in the camp. But he said, He is Moses. It is not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger burned and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf with which they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. Then Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself, that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, Make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. And now when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control, to be a derision among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Every man of you put his sword upon his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. So let's look at the rest of this golden calf. Those people are looking. This right here, I don't know if you can tell. Oh, let me get it. This is the oldest pictograph of the bull. Can you see right here? Can you see that? Here's his body, head, his horns. That's the oldest one there. They've got them. They've known all along. You know what they call, they've called this mountain? We call it Mount Sinai. They call it Jabal Laws. They've always said it was the mountain of laws. But now they've changed it to where it's Moses Mountain. And that's why they had this, you know, Alvin mentioned all the different people that have been there, you know, illegally and that wrote the books. And, you know, they, they saw all this stuff. I mean, can you imagine what that was like? Those, I mean, the, the strength and courage those people had to, you know, maybe nobody would have ever really figured it out. Here's another view of that altar. That altar was huge. You can see those huge stones. This was a guy in our group who stood on part of it, so you can sort of see how big it is. Then this next slide has to do with the scripture I just read. This is the graveyard of the 3,000 people. 
This is where they buried them. You can still see some of the headstones. See these headstones? This has all been preserved. And I think it's because God knew they'd make it. In, right now, you know what they told me on the plane? They told me they were about to make it into a ski resort. <laughs> I said, really? How are you going to do that? And do you know what they told me? With AI. Here's another picture of this graveyard. This gives you another view of, of Mount Sinai. See, we're all the way around it. We keep going. It's a huge, huge, huge area. I wanted to show you, this is my driver, Talib. He was my, you know, when I went, I thought, I'm kind of scared about this. I wasn't a big fan of Middle Eastern men. And, you know, I was thinking, he uh, was the sweetest, kindest man uh, we didn't speak the same language at all, but by the end of the week, we were like best buds, and we understood each other. His son was with us a lot. Beverly was with us the whole time. Some of you met Beverly, my friend from Australia. There's Beverly. I wanted to show you a picture of how we got around. We looked like we were in a commercial. We were in these white SUVs driving everywhere. Um, it was kind of hilarious, really. These guys drive like, I've been all over the world, and they're the worst drivers I've ever been. <laughs> they are, you just better just don't pay attention, because they're going, they took us to camel races, and they were racing alongside the camels. And, you know, there was 10 guys racing, you know, they're, they're racing cars while we're racing camels. I mean, it was, it was intense. There's another picture of the of the line of cars. So we were just driving through the desert. I just thought it was sort of funny that we're driving through the desert in all these white SUVs. It was just sort of funny. Um, this is just the last picture, the last day of Taleb wanted a picture. Uh, he, he was just a sweet man. And um, he invited me to his home with his wife and all of his children and everything. And I didn't get to go because it was the last day. But, you know, he was a very sweet person. and. I think he got to see what we did, you know. And I was with some Torah-keeping people and Shabbat-keeping people, so that was really neat, and I was glad that I got to do that. Uh, it was a great trip. I would, I don't know what's going on with the future of travel. You know, I've prayed about it. If, you know, we pray about it. Maybe if things don't go the way I think they're going to go, maybe we could all do a trip there or something, you know, those that wanted to go. But... The last thing I wanted to show you is this fence. Can you see this fence right here? Can, I, I can barely see it, so I don't know if you can see it or not. Can you see the fence? That was the fence that was all the way around that all your people that you read in your books snuck under. That's the fence. And it was knocked down. And we just basically walked over it. I mean, they don't care. It was just knocked down. And so we, they told us we were pioneers because we were the first legal people to do it. <laughs> anyway, it was, a, it was a privilege to go. It was uh, very enlightening. Does anybody have any questions? I'm sorry, what did you say? How long? What's the distance of the land? Oh, well, it took me about an hour and a half to hike through it. Maybe two. That, I was going at a pretty fast clip. It took other people longer. I was the, in the front. Yeah, it's long. Did you have a question, Ken? It was, I was there for five days. And you'd be in the car all day, and then you'd see maybe one thing or two things. Or it was a lot. It's a lot of driving, it's a, but they have great roads. They've got. They've gone in. Europe has gone in. America has gone in. They've got roads like you cannot believe, and they're they're saying that they're building all these cities. Now I didn't see the first piece of rebar. Okay, I saw, I saw squares or circles, things that might be where you would put a foundation for a building but no, nothing. Now, they do have these cities called Noam and the line. You can go online and look at these places that they say they're building. Well, what they really are are these 15-minute cities. Do you know what that is? Where once you're in that city, you can't leave. You can't go further than 15 minutes. 
They're basically prisons is what I think they are. Got, they've got all these consultants having meetings about the meetings and they're going to build this, they're going to do that, and they're doing all this AI and they're going to, you know, they're going to seed the clouds and they're going to do all this. It's, it's very uh, frightening really to me. But I didn't see any of that. You could just see they built this Noem. Go look, up, go look it up. It's N-O-E-M. You can look it up online. The city where they're having all the meetings about the meetings about building the cities because they want to have tourism. The, um, the Sheikh is pouring mil billions into all this. And so, you know, they, they told me they could make that into a ski resort with AI. Really? That's scary. And I thought to myself, I don't think God's going to let you build a ski resort on this mountain. <laughs> Ran? Well, uh, the, all the guides were real friendly on our guides. The locals, the women, don't give you very good looks. Because, well, first of all, I wouldn't if I were them either. It's, because we were, you know, we didn't have masks. We didn't have those things on and all that. But we had hats. You know, we were being respectful, but I wasn't going to wear that thing. But the women kind of gave you dirty looks. We weren't around that many locals. We were just in a hotel by ourselves and then just with our guides. And there's not very much, all the good hotels, all the consultants have taken up. So there's really, it's kind of, they're just getting started. I'll say that. But they have a good attitude about it. The people that are working there, they're real sweet and kind. Okay, can I pray? Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your word and thank you for just, um, revealing truth to us. And Father, I pray that we would be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Thank you, Father, that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear. I speak blessings and favor over this group of people. I speak a hedge of protection around them. And I pray in the coming days we would be strong and courageous and wise and discerning. In the name of Yeshua, I pray. Amen.